like you know me me and my partners have had so much group sex like over the years right <laughs> humble brag <laughs> um and it's there's still kind of things that come up now because we're different people like our tastes might have changed we might like you know maybe like you used to be a voyeur like now that you want to you know be more of an exhibitionist you know like things change people change um so things come up all the time Welcome back to Open Late Podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Spandiari, and I've got a little favor that I want to ask you for today before we get going. There are so many of you that listen to the show every week or, you know, at least monthly, you have check ins and then you binge it to catch up because you tell me, um, but are not yet subscribed to the show. It's so important to our work. Um, and to increase our visibility so more people can find us if we have more subscribers. So please just take five seconds right now, hop outside of this episode, click the little plus sign or the little follow if you're on Apple or Spotify. Make sure you're subscribing if you're a YouTube watcher as well. And if you didn't know, we're on YouTube. While you're at it, um, our Instagram account recently got banned and with no warning, with no explanation, we just had all of our content, our whole account just taken down. So if you like our content on Instagram and you find that this is important sex positive education, then please also turn on the notifications for Openly, the podcast, as well as saving pieces of our content um, or direct messaging, you know, our quotes and different things that we create to people, direct messaging reels. Um, I know that this, you know, seems like it'll take a little bit of work, but if this content is important to you and you don't want to see it buried or censored by the Instagram algorithm, it can make a huge difference in keeping our platforms alive. Um, and it would mean the world to me. So, Without further ado, I want to get into this episode. Today, I have the incredible Leanne Yao on the show. She is a polyamorous content creator, writer, and relationship educator. She's got hundreds of thousands of followers across her Instagram and TikTok platforms, and she creates humorous educational memes and other bite-sized content specific to non-monogamy, queer relationships, and sex positivity. So let's dive in with Leanne. You've been, you know, you've been blogging and being on social media, you know, educating people around these topics, non-monogamy, for not that long. Like you said, less than two, three years. Less than two years. So it will be um, like I started it November 19th, um, 2020. Yeah. What was the reason that you wanted to be public and create content that was, you know, both entertaining and educational, which I've heard you say a couple of times, edutaining. And I was like, I love this word. Yeah. Um, was there a moment where you were like, oh, I'm going to start doing this because of. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the, um, you know, my blog um, as it is today um, definitely was more of an evolution. I definitely didn't set out um, to kind of do what I'm doing right now. Um, back then in 2020, when I started my page, um, like I was very much just like, well, I want a place to just write down my thoughts about various things to do with polyamory, non-monogamy, my life, personal growth, um, stuff like that. Um, and it was mostly due to like, you know, my, my friends were very encouraging. My friends were like, oh yeah, like, you know, cause I, I've always been like the kind of like the mum friend, like in my, in my friendship group. Mm. Um, like I'm always the person that people turn to for um, kind of relationship advice, emotional support, that kind of thing. Um, so that was already something I was doing in my personal life. And at some point, like some of my friends were just like, why don't you just write this down somewhere? I think this would be really helpful for a lot of people. Mm. Um, and I was also really bored uh, <laughs> cause you know, it was 2020. So I, yeah, I started a website and I wrote some articles. Um, and those articles didn't get that much attention at first. Um, and then one day I was like, hmm, you know, it'd be nice to like also talk about like the funny aspects of polyamory. I'd like to make more um, kind of lighthearted content and like, you know, maybe inject some levity into the conversation. Like maybe some humor will help people talk about like even the most difficult topics. Um, and I started posting memes and then my first meme went viral. Um, and mm. so it just kind of took off from there. And I was like, oh okay so this is what people want um you know people people want like like short 
bite-sized content like people and you know it kind of made sense you know in the age of like tiktok and everything like that like you know people's attention spans are getting shorter um people don't really have the time or energy to you know read a book or like you know scroll through an article or um you know listen to like a whole you know i i I don't know like you know people have less time for that these days um yeah and so so i was like okay so if like my goal is to educate as many people as possible and you know reach as many people as possible and make my content as accessible as possible then the strategy is to make things short um and so yeah like basically i started you know focusing on brevity kind of like the writing the blog thing you know the articles kind of fell to the wayside um and so yeah like a lot of my content is very um you know concise and brief like for this reason and sometimes you know nuance gets lost in the brevity um but yeah. then it does create interesting conversations in the comment section um and you know people like interpret my advice in all kinds of different ways in uh, some ways that are applicable to their lives some not um and mm. yeah like and it all just you know became like a really great way to reach more people um and 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 talk about the topic more more widely um so so yeah like it it was it was an evolution for sure but like now kind of i would describe my content as very much like bite size you know like bite size visually accessible kind of engaging content that you know um you know you can you can make the time to to read and kind of even if you all you learn is like you know a new term or like a new concept like that's kind of enough for me like i don't need someone to you know just like scroll through like a whole blog and you know read like the ins and outs of like various aspects of like things you know um i want to get people in the door um that's kind of the that's the main goal so um so yeah like that was the evolution of 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 my page you know from it started from just like a a, like a place where i just wrote essays to um you know short videos memes uh like tweets um and uh yeah things like that yeah why why is it so important for this to be accessible because you've said this a couple times now and i think it's you know, I think I might know, but for people listening um, and who are new to this, mm-hmm. I know it's like there's a there's not a ton of content out there. There's not you know a lot of education. Mm-hmm. You know why has been sort of your focal point and maybe one of your driving forces to have this content be like widely accessible. Yeah, so I think you touched on one, you know, which is that like not a lot of people know what polyamory is, and you know typically. Um, you know, what the information about polyamory that I'd seen, um, you know, prior to me starting my page were mostly kind of books and long articles and kind of like old blog pages and stuff like that. And, you know, lots of people before me have done fantastic, amazing work for decades, right? There are some kind of like veteran poly activists who have been, um, you know, really like kind of paving the way, right? Um, but it also, you know, like it also was inaccessible to a lot of people because it was very long form um and Mm -hmm. i think like you know as kind of trends like come and go right like that kind of thing like wasn't really so appealing to as many people um so so yeah like i think accessibility is important because um you know like the snappier your content is like the 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 easier it is for people to get to the more likely and the more willing they are to actually absorb any of the information um, you know, mm-hmm. you don't want to throw someone in the deep end, like, you know, you give them a glass of water. <laughs> um, and yeah. so, um, so yeah, that's the first reason. I think secondly, um, uh, so I, I've, I've diagnosed with um, autism and ADHD, uh, ADHD more recently, autism I've known about for a very long time. Um, and ADHD people have very short attention spans. And there has been kind of some um, ongoing research kind of documenting like the link between uh like non-monogamy queerness uh and um adhd and so i was like Mm -hmm. okay so another reason to kind of appeal to people who may or may not potentially be open to open relationships um is you know they they're probably more likely to be neurodivergent and so you know how Mm -hmm. do i capture that audience right um and that was something really important to me um you know as a neurodivergent person myself understanding kind of how my brain worked and trying to appeal to other people whose brains also work similarly. I want to kind of touch on you you said this all happened during the pandemic and I, you know, as another creator have had two years at this now. Um, you know, one just basically starting to open up about it, not really putting it on a platform or 
Um, I gave like one talk in a public space. And then I started doing some Instagram lives called Open Late on Sunday. I launched the podcast just about a year ago. Maybe when this comes out, it'll be a year and a half. Who knows? Um, but I, you know, I've been slowly growing this platform. You started probably at around the same time, maybe earlier doing your blog and have had like so much success in the TikTok space, but it it lined up with COVID, as you were saying. Like, what role do you think the pandemic has played in, you know, kind of non-monogamy being a trending topic or things that people are really curious about because same I've people are like wow your podcast is really growing quickly and I'm like I think it's just where we are right now you know mm -hmm. you earlier you said right place right time and I think that's true um but I haven't really thought much about it like where would we be if we started this type of work 10 years ago mm -hmm. would it be different mm -hmm. um yeah I'd love to get you know that yeah, like I absolutely think that, um, you know, you and I and many other people who are kind of doing this work now um, in the last two years are at the right place at the right time. Um, and I absolutely do think that there is a huge correlation between uh, the pandemic and the kind of the rise of interest in non-monogamy. And this is well documented, right? Like I'm, it's not just because I'm in my little bubble. Um, like, so, you know, Field, which is a kind of non-monogamous dating app um, and of which I am the brand ambassador, uh, they... Um, uh, like they documented like just like the rise in signups I think it was like a 200 percent increase um, and you know like a I don't know like a several hundred percent increase of like people who were signing up and also like interested in threesomes specifically so like like lots of couples having these conversations right um, but I would say that the pandemic definitely led to many people just having just reaching like I guess some sort of reckoning um, you know and uh, doing a lot of introspection um with you know in within themselves and um about their lives and the, kind of their choices and their relationships and their identities right um i very vividly remember during the pandemic i had three friends come out to me as trans in the same week um and you know it, i do have a lot of queer friends but like it, it was a lot you know clearly a lot of people were um you know because the world was like slowing down there wasn't much else to do you know people were alone with their own thoughts and that was terrifying for a lot of people but it also meant that um you know you really got to slow down and actually you know when, once your kind of routines are all crumbled you look at your life and you're like is there something more i could be doing with with this you know have i made the right choices up until now which is why you know um I think like a lot of a lot of people kind of came out as queer a lot of people um you know started exploring non-monogamy um you know a lot of people started businesses and made changes to their lives in various different ways right um yeah. and so yeah and I, and I think also um you know so one one of one of the people that I admire the most in the world is Esther Perel, um, who is mm -hmm. like a relationship uh, and a couples therapist. Um, and she's done a lot of TED talks about, um, you know, desire in long-term relationships and, um, you know, infidelity and why it happens. Um, and I just think she's a fascinating person. And one of the things that uh, she has said that has really stuck with me, you know, like over the past two years is um, she talked about how, in infidelity, which I understand is obviously very different from kind of polyamory and monogamy, but some of the principles apply. She said that, um, you know, when people kind of look outside, look for connection, like outside of their relationship, they're often um, trying to, it's not because they're seeking another person, but they're seeking a different version of themselves. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I think, uh, like, I really resonated with that in, in the sense that, like, I do kind of get to explore different facets of myself with kind of multiple partners. And I think, um, you know, in all that kind of self-exploration uh, that people were, you know, going through, um, you know, I think that idea became very appealing and non-monogamy naturally kind of got wrapped up in that. And I think also mm. with all this, you know, tragedy and kind of death and just, you know, facing your mortality, like, you know, happening around you, um, it was very natural to kind of question your choices and be like, you know, um, like as 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 Asta said, like you know, is is this is is this it? And you know, could there be more? Um, yeah. So yeah, like I think I think there is a link. 
um, you know, uh, and obviously I'm also willing to admit that maybe, you know, a small minority of people were just really sick of living with their spouses and wanted to replace them, <laughs> you know, like, obviously people yeah. don't always get into polyamory for the right reasons, right? Like, you know, gotta acknowledge that, but um, mm-hmm. for the most part, like, I do think it is driven by, like, a desire for self-discovery and exploration. Yeah, beautiful. Wow, there's so much to touch on and so many kind of threads I want to pull, but I actually, you just said something that we're going to jump right into this because I think that there are so many people, like you're saying, that maybe don't enter into polyamory or non-monogamy for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a huge learning curve, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, non-monogamy forces you to sort of deconstruct everything as like you, you say in a lot of your work. But I do feel like there's a lot of sort of shaming and gatekeeping and, you know, judgment um, when people come into this space from people that have either been there a long time or, you know, have been, have figured it out how to do it well or, you know, healthy, like I'm doing air quotations for people who can't see. And that's obviously what we all want to work towards because we want to be the best version of ourselves, period, even though this is a piece of our lives. But like, um, well, this is what made me want to ask you about this because you recently tweeted and it was somebody else's tweet, but I resonated with it so much. And it was like, you know, I don't know who's saying like, bye girls do not want to like have sex with you and your partner, but like, I'm right here. And like, I want to have sex with you and your partner. And I was like, me too. Stop saying this. Like, <laughs> I, I there's a certain group of people that, you know, are not in that space where like, that's, what they want to those those aren't the types of people they want, want to be attracting. They don't want to be asked by the you know, um, like cis het you know man and his girlfriend to like be their like unicorn person. Mm-hmm. But there are plenty of people out there who do want that, right? Mm-hmm. Because we're in a different place. Like I am in a different place. I'm married. I've had a you know to a man who's who's heterosexual. I've had a female partner for three years that I'm very much in love with. Um, I'm, you know, older, 30, 38, I'll be 38. I want to have kids soon. And I do want to be having threesomes with couples. Like that's exactly what I want to be doing right now. Cause I want like no pressure, no commitment. I want, I want to be the fun one. Like Mm -hmm. I'm having like a bloody year. Like I'm just here for it. Like what I want. And so I really appreciated that. And to kind of go back to what I was going to ask you, it's like, there is a lot of sort of, this is right. This is wrong. If you're going to play in our pool, you know, you got to respect the rules, Gatekeeper. which I've, I've been, I've also, I've had those thoughts and mm-hmm. I've had those conversations with sure. people. Um, but now that I'm a bit older and I've changed, I'm like, okay, I think we're doing a lot of generalizing. I think we're doing a lot of like, you can't come in cause you don't have it all figured out. Yeah. You got to do more work on yourself. And I just don't know that that's right because so many people want to be doing this and they're not going to do it right when they first get here. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, definitely. There's a couple of things going on in that. Like, I think, I think polyamorous people are really, really scared about new polyamorous people being messy because it, you know, uh, affects a reputation that is already very fragile. You know, I think with, um, I think naturally when you're part of a marginalized group, um, you know, there is this pressure to perform to a higher standard than um the majority because you know you've got you want to you want to kind Mm -hmm. of appear a certain way and be like presentable and accepted and you know seen um as valid and so you know any anyone or any like who kind of starts like acting up um and doing things that you don't approve of like it's a kind it creates a kind of insecurity um because they're like uh, you're you're gonna ruin it for the rest of us um and i understand that fear you know and obviously i think that it's everyone you know needs to exercise caution right like when engaging with multiple people obviously um but but then you know uh i also think to some extent we need to allow newbies to be a little bit messy (laughs) um and also you know like you can't guarantee that you'll never cause drama that you'll never hurt your partners you know even now um six years in uh six or seven years in you know we're we're still making mistakes right like um Mm -hmm. and we should be allowed to without having um 
you know, kind of our, like, valid validity, you know, like, stripped away from us. But, you know, I do understand that it comes from a place of insecurity from, you know, just being part of a marginalized group. Like, I feel this, you know, like, as a woman, yeah. I feel like I have to prove myself. As a person of color, I feel like I have to prove myself. As a neurodivergent person, people make certain assumptions about me as an autistic person. Um, so, yeah, like, you know, so, like, I, like, I feel the pressure too, right? Um, but then that doesn't mean that, you know, we have to be like so harsh to new people. Um, and yeah, like, I think also, you know, I suppose, like, I don't know what your experience has been of kind of like online forums that kind of discuss polyamory. So, you know, um, you know, Facebook, Reddit, uh, kind of Discord, uh, you know, chats yeah. and that kind of thing. I have so little. Uh -huh. I have the only place really do this as Instagram right so. okay yeah I mean you know like I used to frequent the Facebook groups and uh, Reddit threads like quite a lot um but then you know I quickly realized that um you know like some people could be really dogmatic like I think there is value in crowdsourcing advice from um you know like a large group of people and getting like a diversity of opinions about various things on, on your situation but oftentimes it just turned into a virtue signaling dog pile if i'll be honest mm -hmm. um and you know like i i want to kind of like extend you know like love and appreciation to like all the moderators and admins who do run those groups they do an absolutely thankless job um you know i have personally you know lots of people have told me like leanne run a discord discord channel like do a facebook group and i'm like fuck no um because like i know it's a lot of work um but you know it yeah. like but but i i, I do want to say like you know despite kind of all of that um, there is like a certain kind of culture and I, I don't think it's just in these groups. I think it's just also on the internet where people like want to comment on things to kind of prove that they know something or prove that they're better than someone rather than because they actually want to help them. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, like I think definitely, um, there are people who go into polyamory for the wrong reasons. Um, and then, uh, like, you know, I think offering them kind of like support and advice and stuff like that is great but then you know just like shaming them <laughs> um is not really going to make them want to listen to you um right. so and you know i think what you said about like the, you know your experience is kind of like wanting to be a unicorn like and how that's kind of like where where you're at right now and what you want to do the most like uh, in my kind of early days uh like you know at at university you know i uh, like i also engaged in a lot of reasons i loved being a unicorn like it was great um and uh you know it was all about kind of like finding the people who were on the same page and people who um you know like to some like had talked about stuff and like to some extent had their shit together i've had some positive experiences right. with couples i've had some where like you know they ended up breaking up after the threesome you know so it's been like a wide variety yeah. of experiences um and so you know um rather than kind of discouraging like people from just doing it like i think it makes more sense to be like okay well you know i can't stop you but here's how you can kind of do it safely like which kind right. of works with like everything else right sex drugs yeah. anything um exactly. it's risky but you know you mm -hmm. if you're gonna do it well you know here's what you need to know and here's what you need to consider and here's what you need to be looking at uh, looking out for um right so yeah like i think it's just you know i've written um like some some articles i've delivered workshops and i've been interviewed um for various kind of media publications on kind of the phenomenon of unicorn hunting and being a unicorn and you know like how to navigate it from like both sides right because i've been um i've been like the women in the couple and i've been the women like to like unicorn for another couple and like there's kind of different considerations on both sides yeah Absolutely. I would love for you to share a little bit about that. I didn't realize that you had written about that specifically. And that's a question I get a ton from sort of my listeners. I have a lot of listeners who are brand new mm -hmm. to non-monogamy and that's where they're starting. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, this is what we feel comfortable with. And I'm like, shocker. <laughs> exactly how, you know, we, start, we started to almost 10 years ago, very much by accident. We never even discussed having a threesome before. Mm -hmm. We just had like this experience that happened in, in one night. Um, but what would you say, I mean, maybe just give a point from like each side is important to, um, you know, know going into it and to be on the same page about. Yeah. Um, I think probably the first thing to acknowledge is probably the inherent power dynamic involved and how like that needs to be addressed. 
Um, because yeah, like if you're going into it as an established couple, you inherently have a lot more security in your situation than like the single person that you're inviting in, in the sense that you, 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 you know, you're a team, like you know each other a lot better, you know, you're, you're both getting to know one person each, whereas that new person is getting to know two complete strangers. Um, and so, you know, and there is very much going to be on some level, like, like, you know, a hierarchy in the sense that like if you've been together longer and you're looking for a casual threesome um you know like your kind of like relationship like to like the third person um is going to be you know is going to be deprioritized uh, compared to like the couple relationship um and mm -hmm. so i think kind of navigating like that gulf in um you know I guess privilege, I suppose, if you want to call it that, um, is is really important because there are some, there are like there are some unicorns who probably um, you know they they like kind of like being um, you know like the no commitment kind of like just the fun one who kind of gets invited in and stuff like that, and there are some who kind of want something a bit more serious, right? Like there's like I think the really confusing thing about the whole unicorn hunting, hunting conversation is that like there are unicorns who like want to have threesomes and then there are unicorns in the sense that like you want like a full-on romantic triad and like they are two very <laughs> different conversations um yeah. and i mostly kind of speak to like unicorn hunting in the context of casual threesomes because i think like the expectations there are just going to be like easier to navigate right um mm -hmm. so i think um yeah kind of definitely like acknowledging that first um and going like okay so you know um are we on the same page about kind of what our expectations are here? Like if you're a couple who are like, um, oh yeah, like, you know, we want a one-time thing. Um, or are you going to be like, oh yeah, like we want like a consistent friend with benefits kind of situation. Um, and then mm -hmm. also like, okay, well, what happens if, um, you know, uh, like feelings get involved, for example, or like what happens if, you know, uh, like, they end up being like more attracted to one of us but not the other like do we you know like are we happy for like the other person to continue like seeing them separately or like do we want it, this to be like a group thing only and then you know talking about that like amongst yourselves but also more importantly like with the third person involved and seeing like if they're on board with that um, right because like some like some some unicorns like they prefer it if like the couple is a package deal and if one of them is out they're not interested anymore um, because they specifically mm -hmm. want that group experience and then some of them are like uh you know i want to have like individual connections with both of these people and um you know if like if like one of them kind of like falls out of the equation i still want to have the freedom to see the other one and if you're not on board with that i'm not on board with that like so like there's kind of there's so much there's so much to talk about like even before you even get to the bedroom <laughs> or like you know yeah. even kind of like actually start doing anything um and i think also you know logistics when it comes to like the threesome itself like what do you want to get out of it mainly are you a person who likes to watch are you a person who likes to direct are you going to introduce kink into this dynamic um you know uh like what happens if someone feels insecure, gets jealous? Like, are there any kind of hard limits? Um, and, you know, is there anything, you know, how are you going to navigate, like, kind of safer sex protocols? Like, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, what expectations are realistic and what are what are not? Uh, so, for example, like, I once had a threesome where uh, basically it was stipulated beforehand that the guy was only allowed to come in her and not in me. Um, mm -hmm. And you know neither of them had ever had a threesome before the novelty of the situation got very overwhelming and he did end up like you know like you know <laughs> finishing early in me um and uh and yeah and they and they had a huge fight about it but then you know if you think about the logistics sometimes like things don't turn out the way you planned you know you're like yeah even with regular sex you're like come here at this time like no like yeah. that's not gonna be a realistic thing to ask of someone um you know mm -hmm. you for some to some extent you need to kind of allow for like organic flow <laughs> yeah so um yeah you know talk about like what you want to get out of it but also like what happens if things go wrong like what happens if things don't yeah. go as planned um there's so much to talk about yeah that's so only like a, honestly a taster of the things mm -hmm. that need to be discussed and you know uh some people We're can argue you can just kind of wing it and it might go well but like honestly for the, yeah like the, there is there is a lot that can potentially come up you know there's threesomes yeah. that like you know me me and my partners 
have had so much group sex like over the years right <laughs> humble brag <laughs> um and it's there's still kind of things that come out now because we're different people like our tastes might have changed we might like you know maybe like you used to be a voyeur like now that you want to you know be more of an exhibitionist you know like things change mm-hmm. people change um so things come up all the time yeah yeah. I love this conversation so, so much. And we're going to link, I'm, we're, I'm going to link these articles directly into the show notes because I think they're so valuable, everything that you're sharing and for people to like have it and and see it because mm-hmm. this is how a lot of people want to start. Um, and this is what's really exciting. And this is like a big fantasy for so many. And so I think to be like, you know, armed with all the tools that you can possibly have, you know, from somebody who's, you know, clearly been down this road and who's doing it well and, you know, creating a lot of education around it. Like you can't go wrong if you're going to have all of these tools. So definitely read this article. Um, so, so funny that we're talking about, because I feel like if you pull back the whole philosophy of moving into non-monogamy and then maybe even into like polyamory, which I think is maybe the the type of non-monogamy that maybe requires the most sort of personal growth and development Mm -hmm. um, and emotional intelligence, maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like, that's the thing that we're moving away from because monogamy teaches us that we like own each other and each other's bodies. So of course a rule that would, you know, is born out of wanting to make someone else feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Like you could only come to me, right? Because we don't want to like cause more trauma. I want to like gently step into these Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a lot of, yeah. It's like, it's like, okay, cool. I understand where that comes from. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm trying to put like ownership and limits on your bodily functions, which is like what monogamy is. And so I think like you talk a lot about how it's really dismantling, like non-monogamy dismantles everything we've learned about relationships. And as people, I think will practice more and more and develop into their non-monogamy or their polyamory. Um, at least I've seen two in my friends and clients, like the, those things start to be less and less important as people create their own sense of safety and security and have their own self-confidence. Um, yeah. but I, but I, um, I love it because that's how we have to enter in. If we want to play in the pool, like we've got to put a life jacket on and this is what makes us feel safe. I'd love to turn it towards your journey a bit for people who might not know. Um, how did you get your start? Were you in a couple? Were you uncoupled when you started your non-monogamy journey? Yeah, so um, I think I definitely started thinking about non-monogamy when I was uh, like single. Um, well, kind of, sort of. So I... So, I may as well tell the longer version of the story. Um, So I was in one monogamous relationship um, when I was 16. And, um, you know, and it was fine. You know, like some people report like being really uncomfortable in in, like monogamous relationships, like feeling kind of really trapped or whatever. That wasn't really the case with me. Okay, so we actually had a, I actually had an okay time. Um, But, uh, you know, the relationship ended um, because uh, he, my boyfriend at the time, uh, cheated on me with a boy uh, in our year at school um, and you know he didn't tell me about this for three months and they were sleeping together consistently for like quite a, you know that period of time um, ultimately he you know confessed uh, kind of what what had happened to me so I didn't find out about it he told he, t- he told me um, so I didn't find out about it he told me and um you know in the moment obviously I was devastated and I was very distraught but I was also like mostly really upset because he hadn't talked about this to me like I knew that he was bisexual but like I didn't know that he had wanted to explore his sexuality um and I was like why didn't you just you know ask me like why you know why did you have to go through all the fuss of going behind my back and hiding all this from me when we could have had a conversation I would have probably been okay with it um and so you know and he like you know he was very shocked he was very surprised that I thought this way and I think that kind of created like a bit of a shift because I was like oh wait other people don't think like this um Mm. and then you know obviously we we broke up um you know uh like I think we tried to kind of salvage the relationship but there was just too much guilt involved um so you know it the relationship couldn't sustain itself ultimately 
Um, and then in my second relationship, which was fairly soon after, um, we were monogamous for a while, but then, um, you know, school finished and we were going a separate way. So he was going off to university in America and I was going to be doing a gap year in China with my family. And, um, basically the conversation of non-monogamy came up quite naturally because we were like okay we were looking at the other relationships around us you know the people who had all met at high school and a lot of them had decided that because they were going off to different universities they were going to break up because they were never going to see each Mm. other again and it was going to be too painful to be in a monogamous relationship and some of them you know continued relationships but then they went on to cheat on each other um Mm -hmm. and we were like there's got to be like a third way right <laughs> like you know we we were both kind of quite realistic about it we were just kind of like okay um we're gonna be long distance we're probably not gonna see each other for like six months at a time like in person um we're both horny ass teenagers uh with sexual needs that will go unmet if we remain monogamous so mm-hmm. it makes sense to open up the relationship and moreover you know he was going to a completely new country and ex- experiencing university life for the first time i was like well obviously i want you to enjoy all that university life has to offer and i really want to hear about what a good time you're having um so you know it was a very uh logical and practical decision um it wasn't you know it wasn't like a lot of kind of typical stories you see where one person kind of brings up to the other person and then they have a huge fight about it. It was something that both of us kind of recognized was like a pragmatic, um, you know, solution to like what would obviously become a really big problem that we might end up resenting each other for. Um, So that was kind of how it started out. Um, Ultimately, like, it uh, t- turned out he was one of those guys who was fine with having multiple partners but lost his shit the moment I started sleeping with other people. So unfortunately mm-hmm. that didn't work out. But, you know, now I am in... Um, yeah, you know, it is what it is. But <laughs> but now, you know, I am in... Um, I'm in a polycule um, of five. Um, so I have, uh, I have a nesting partner um, who I've been with for just over four years now. We celebrated our anniversary on Sunday um yeah and um and then I have two other partners uh one who I see about like once every um so like twice a week and one who I see roughly once every one to two weeks um and uh and yeah and the one I see less frequently um she also has a husband uh, who I'm very good friends with but I'm not so he's my metamor so we're not we're not kind of sexually romantically involved but we are very close friends and the five of us have a Dungeons and Dragons campaign because we have fallen into that classic polyamorous stereotype and we are all nerds um we are all gay nerds um so um so that's that's kind of my setup right now um and uh yeah like it's it's been it's been going well and very blessed to have a polycule where everyone gets along because you know i've seen what happens when like metamors uh really don't vibe with each other or you know yeah. like people prefer kind of more parallel dynamics where there has to be kind of a lot of um negotiation of kind of like what's kept private and what what when to be transparent with each other about stuff and it's a lot you know and not to say that we don't have those conversations but definitely the transparency between everyone involved has made life just so much easier Mm, yeah um it's funny I had an opposite version of what you had Mm -hmm. going into you know university or this this time of your um you know your gap year Mm -hmm. where I had a boyfriend who wanted to remain together and I was doing the whole like I love you, still want to be with you, but I'm going to be living in Italy. (laughs) You're going to be living in Pennsylvania. So maybe we should rethink this. And in hindsight, I mean, this was 20 years ago for me. I don't think I had an inkling of what non-monogamy was, but I knew that I still wanted to have a relationship with him, but I wouldn't see him. So I was like, maybe we break up, but plan on like, you know, getting back together or whatever the case might be. Um, because I had no language or tools or understanding of of what non-monogamy was. Um, and he was like, no, you're not breaking up. And I didn't have, it sounds like you were very sexually confident um, and maybe a bit more mature as a like woman knew what you wanted. Um, I was like, okay, cool. We're not breaking up. You know, it was like, this was what he said. And then he ended up cheating on me. Oh, no. Was- oh, no. <laughs> the just- audacity. 
what I basically told you that that's what you should do, but let's be honest with each other about it. I didn't miss out on a lot of hot Italian sex, probably. Oh, oh so, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, the stories I, about people who are like, they you know they bring up an open relationship and then their partner says no and then that same partner ends up cheating on them and they're like why why <laughs> like you we could we had the option to do this the right way <laughs> like why did you do this um and it, it, it just points to like how much of a taboo non-monogamy still is but how normalized infidelity is that people will go there and think that this doesn't make me a weirdo this just is what people do I, and yeah. for us yeah, I mean, I think it's more than which, that, though. I think it's more than you know the normalization of kind of infidelity over non-monogamy. I think it's also that um, ultimately, like one of one of my like one of my hotter takes um, is that I think the vast majority of monogamous people, not all but most, um, are monogamous not because they genuinely like want to devote themselves to one person but because they want their partners to devote the, themselves to them. Um, yeah, so when I speak to yeah. monogamous people about why they couldn't do polyamory, like it's always the same stuff. It's always like, ah, oh, I can't, I don't want to share or I, mm -hmm. I don't, I like, you know, I, I like, I, I get jealous and insecure about my partner with other people. It's never like, no, it's because I want to devote myself to one person and I find fulfillment in that. Um, or, you know, like, like I just really like only love one person at a time. Like obviously there's some people who say this, but they are very much in the minority. It's always focusing on how like they couldn't be polyamorous because like they couldn't watch their partners be polyamorous. It's not about how right. they themselves couldn't be polyamorous. Um, and I've always found that really interesting. So yeah, like I do think that, you know, uh, in the phenomenon where like, someone's like let's try an open relationship and the partner's like no and the partner cheats it's like them saying i want to be i want to have multiple partners but like i'm not okay with you having multiple partners yeah um i yeah i i really agree with you here and i but i also want to take it a step further because i think that there are a lot of people who yes maybe it it's like inconceivable for them to think about their partner with another person. Mm -hmm. But I also, I think that it's the, what would the perception of me be mm -hmm. from the outside world, which is what a lot of people are concerned with that outside judgment. If they knew, I knew my wife was having sex with another man. And I think that that plays a huge role in the like, oh, I could never. Mm -hmm. And Maybe that's just like my community, but I think that also stems back. So it's like both and from my opinion, because you're hundred percent right. There's like so many people that it brings up so many uncomfortable emotions. They can't even think about it and they don't want to. But I imagine that a lot of what plays into that is the judgment of outside community. It's like what kind shame. of be, yeah, if I let my wife have sex with other people. And so I think that that plays a huge role too in that like, yeah, I could never, which ultimately comes back to the taboo of non-monogamy. Like it's very it's very interesting yeah. that you bring up a specific example of the idea of your wife having sex with another man. So that suggests you're speaking from the perspective yeah. of a man who is uncomfortable mm -hmm. with their wife sleeping with someone else. Um because yeah, yeah, like you know, there is this whole idea of like, you know, being like the cuck, right? Like and how yeah. um, you know, the uh, like the you know it's it it's like shame you know like it's shameful like as a man to not like for, for to be perceived as not being able to kind of sexually satisfy your partner because there is kind of so much like masculinity uh, kind of tied up in kind of like sexual performance and like monogamy and kind of like keeping your woman in line and that kind of stuff right, right? like um I, I talk about this more like I've talked about this more like with with other people um you know about kind of just like how like masculinity like particularly can you know concept of like toxic masculinity like really kind of gets broken down in these spaces um and um yeah like obviously it's about it's, it's about stigma and shame but also to some extent yeah kind of gendered perceptions of like non-monogamy um it's like oh you're being yeah. kind of taken advantage of and this happens for women as well you know like i think um as a woman you know in a non-monogamous relationship a lot of people assume that it was my boyfriend's idea um mm -hmm. and it's like no uh 
no is mine <laughs> um and uh you know like assuming that like i you know i i don't get much action or like i'm crying myself to sleep every night or something like that um <laughs> um <laughs> yeah and and you know like and i'm not you know i'm not even married i don't have children like you know i see other people who like have you know have families and you know there's always the assumption that like they're the ones like staying at home like while their husband's like having all the fun and it's like where did you get this idea like you know we're yeah. trying to advocate for more equality here if anything mm-hmm. um so yeah. i'm not crying <laughs> sorry that, yeah it's okay you're like i'm not crying myself to sleep every night i'm coming myself to sleep <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, I wanted to um, thank you for sharing your your journey and the evolution of it because you know I know that you've done it like on a lot of other shows and it's a uh, it's something I think we all end up doing a lot because people are so interested in the intricacies of how it's working for you because if I hear it from you and you're successful at it then like I know it's possible for me. And I I like to highlight listeners questions sometimes. So I had a really great listener and friend, um, Luke ask what boundaries, um, or, you know, kind of, I I don't like to use the term rules, but like agreements. agreements. Did you have beginning, um, maybe with this nesting partner who seems like it's been, you know, a longer relationship in the beginning that really supported you too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like my, my, my long-term partner is an absolute godsend. Um, uh, but yeah, we don't actually have, uh, that many agreements, um, in the grand scheme of things. I think mostly it's kind of, uh, I think our relationship operates on principles rather than kind of specific agreements, if that makes sense. So like we operate on, you know, kind of like, like honesty and kind of communication about things. Um, and uh you know obviously like with like the logistics and kind of like practicality of kind of non-monogamy when you live together like obviously that kind of factors into things as well um i think probably you know the the biggest agreement we have is you know like around um like safer sex like i think that's a very common one you know um to kind of like negotiate like uh you know when we like you know like when we want to stop using protection with other people or not um and how we navigate that and like how often we get tested and stuff um and i suppose um we have different boundaries around like our living arrangements so for example um you know i'm like a much more like naturally compulsive person um than my partner is Mm -hmm. in the sense that like i have fewer jealousy triggers um And so, you know, hypothetically, if my partner was on a date and he decided to, you know, like he wanted to kind of bring her back to like our flat and like they had sex, like while I was in the other room, I would have absolutely no problem with this as long as this was kind of communicated to me beforehand. So I would, you know, put a shirt on. Mm -hmm. Um, But then, but then, you know, he's not comfortable the other way around. Like if I were to bring someone of any gender home, um, you know, he's not comfortable with like, you know me kind of like having sex like while he's like in the same flat and like not involved Mm -hmm. um and i think that's fair enough right like i think there's this perception in the polyamorous community particularly online in the more kind of dogmatic sections of the internet that you have to learn to be absolutely okay with absolutely everything that your partner is doing and that isn't the case like you're allowed to have personal limits the point of polyamory is not to eradicate like all your boundaries and it's okay if you and your partner have different boundaries you know like logistically it works out fine for me and him because I work from home and he works a nine-to-five so like I have plenty of time to host if I wanted to um Mm -hmm. like I you know I can host like during the daytime in the afternoon like in the early afternoons or you know if he's out with friends then I can host um and so yeah like you know like obviously we have to kind of talk through like the practical elements of uh living together and being open but um yeah for the most part it's just about like you know informing each other of you know like plans so then we can kind of like you know schedule like what we're going to do with us with ourselves like while our partner's doing something else and um and yeah like you know talking about like changes and you know making sure that like everyone who's going to be affected by a decision is consulted before like the decision right. is made um so yeah, that was a very kind of long and wishy-washy answer, but like the kind of crux of it is like, I think it's better to structure your agreements um, uh, around kind of your values and principles rather than just kind of like making 
agreements for the sake of them because if you lose sight of why you made the agreement in the first place then that things can get quite sticky yeah and i think you touched on a lot of beautiful points that most people don't generally consider um and and it shows that it's a lot more about the practicality and the logistics than anything else and when people think about oh boundaries and agreements we got to put all these like things in place without realizing that the actually like the actual things that you will come up against are like are we both going to be home at the same time like what, you know and how is this how is this going to work out because of space because of calendars you know x y and z so i love that you said it's more guiding principles um, that you're working towards and sounds like a lot less of like what you're working away from mm-hmm. which i think always creates a healthier um i think you scenario. put it very beautifully like things to work towards rather than things to move away from for sure yeah yeah awesome well leanne i mean i could do a whole other episode with you and i kind of want to i really want to die i'm i'm very interested in the whole um your perspective and all of the breakdown that you gave us on sort of being a unicorn and like trying to bring a third into your relationship. So I imagine there's so much more that you have great expertise with. Um, Where can people find those articles that you've written? And I know that you've also done voiceover for some eBooks around polyamory. Maybe if you want to highlight some things that you think would be great resources for people. Yeah. So um, on social media, you can find me at polyphilia blog. So that's P O L Y P H I L I A B L O G. Um, Same handle across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, And I also have a Patreon. Um, uh, I also have a shop where I sell some polyamory merch. So that's polyphilia shop. Dot yes. um and uh yeah and i offer uh peer support um for people like you know if you're looking for um you know resources or like emotional support or you know advice or just a second opinion uh, on kind of whatever's going on in your life related to non-monogamy um i offer one-to-one sessions over like email text or video call i'm quite flexible um and uh yeah and you can find all that like on my website polyphilia.blog uh, I've tried to make it as easy as possible for people to find me um, as for the articles and resources I have an FAQ uh, on my website um, as, as for the articles and resources I have an FAQ on my website um, so yeah if you just go to the menu you'll be very easily you'll very easily find it there um, and yeah um, you know I'll send you the articles Jessica so you can link them in the show notes and I have some workshops on threesomes and group sex as well that I can um, I can send links to Thank you so, so much. And yes, like for people who want a judgment-free zone, um, you're always asking a lot of questions like, you know, to this show in, you know, my DMs or whatever it is. So I imagine many of you would benefit from coaching. And Leanne is maybe the best that I've seen (laughs) just through your bite-sized content. Thank you so Um, much. That means a lot. (laughs) I mean, truly, because, well, and I think we started talking about this before we, you know, started recording, but I live in Los Angeles where it's like a hotbed of non-monogamy and you can't find a therapist at this point who isn't completely booked that is sex positive um, and, you know, non-monogamy positive and who's going to really welcome you with open arms and who also has the life experience, like the lived experience of being in it. So I think that, you know, peer support coaching is the perfect thing Obviously, you know, we can't ever replace therapy as no, coaches, but m- most people don't truly need that at this phase if you just want to have that like person who's been through it and can acknowledge you and mm-hmm. sort of validate where you are and help you navigate this time. Yeah. So don't hesitate yeah. to uh, reach out. I think therapy and, and peer support yeah. like offer like very different functions. And so, you know, people have options if they want to you know like whether like therapy is more about kind of focusing on your past and kind of you know analyzing your tendencies and your attachment style and kind of working through insecurities and that kind of thing whereas kind of peer support is more about like yeah you know like emotional support like advice from someone who's kind of acting as like an informed friend and if you just want to talk to someone who gets it but maybe there's no one in your area or like the only people in your area who are polyamorous are the people who are causing the problem in the first place right um (laughs) and yeah like you just want like an outside opinion an outside perspective right like 
um absolutely agree you know peer support should never be like a replacement for therapy i tell people and my clients like very often that it's more of a supplement um or mm-hmm. if it's just you know something else completely that you're looking for because you know there are certain things that therapists like can and can't say you know they're not allowed to tell you directly like what they think you should do you know they ask kind of probing right. questions to get you to find the answers yourselves um Whereas, you know, like peer support and coaching, like it has a bit more flexibility in terms of kind of like, you know, what you might be, what you might be looking for and the kind of dialogues that you want to have. Right. Well, thanks for going into that. I think it's important to, to hear that difference. And um, yeah, I mean, most people don't realize like the nuances between the two and everyone just thinks that they need a therapist a lot of times. So it's really cool um, that you offered that. I'm excited about your birth. I actually haven't ever looked, to be honest. I've, I've done. I've like looked a lot on your website. But do you have anything cool coming out for the holidays? For the holidays, it's like. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I'm I'm doing more workshops. Um, you know, like I had one that happened uh, earlier this month on kind of um, conflict management and polyamory, and that went really well. Um, so yeah, like I'm gonna be doing more workshop, uh, kind of focusing on like conflict and polyamory, and particularly when things go wrong. Um, mm. And because I think yeah, like people talk about a lot about kind of preventing things from happening, but not so much like how to repair from th- when things actually do happen, because they they do, they definitely will. Um, and um you know i uh, like you know with the festive season like coming up um you know last year like i did a podcast in a mini series of 14 episodes um through mm-hmm. december um called happy Pol- yeah, happy Poly- 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 yeah happy yeah. Poly Days. um so i'm still undecided as to whether or not i want to bring that one back but um yeah if you're feeling a bit nostalgic yeah definitely go back and listen to those episodes because i covered quite a lot of different controversial topics uh it related to polyamory um in that kind of 14 episode series so um, yeah yeah so yeah That's like if you listen if you like if you like podcasts and you probably do if you're listening to this one um def- listen listen to my one happy poly days yeah that's around the time that I found you, actually. Really? Like, nice. I remember, yeah, I remember, I think you were like, I don't know, it was like around the time it was like halfway through. So I went mm-hmm. back and binged uh, <laughs> yeah. the first couple. It like, is a very like how I got to know kind of you. series. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really good. You guys have holidays. Um, I, I am thinking about doing merch for the first time mm-hmm. for the for the holidays specifically. And I was like, what can I do that's like cute and I don't know, whatever, catchy. And I think it was like, I can't wait to bring my girlfriend home for the holidays to meet my wife or something. Like I can't Aww. wait to bring my my boyfriend home to meet my husband. <laughs> or just yeah. like something that's yeah, like, yeah, various iterations know, cute. on that. That's adorable. If you guys, yeah, if you guys like that, let me know, and I'll try to make it happen on a t-shirt or a mug. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's been a pleasure, like speaking speaking with you, Jessica, and you know, um, yeah. I think uh, I think your work is really important. You know, I think like podcasts are a really great way to kind of reach like you know audiences again in you know like an accessible way, right? Like um, because yeah, it's. Um, we need to be having kind of more of these conversations and clearly like interest in non-monogamy is only going up um, right like this like it's gotten to the point where there are literally articles now like asking is monogamy dead <laughs> like which you know I yeah. I hope it isn't you know like I think I think there's still value in monogamy and uh, but and I think definitely um, people can afford to have more expansive relationships for sure Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on the show and for for spending your your evening with us. I really (laughs) appreciate you and your work as well. And everyone go check out all the amazingness that is Polyphilia's blog. Bye. Bye.